and welcome to the first in our series of XACC Tech Talks. My name is Cahill McCabe from the Xilinx University Program. Before going to our speakers today, I'd like to just start by briefly introducing the XACC Program and this series of talks. The Xilinx Adaptive Compute Cluster, XACC Program, is a special initiative to support novel research in adaptive compute acceleration for high performance computing. The scope of this program is broad, encompassing systems, architecture, tools, and applications. Over the last year, we have set up four XACC host centers at ETH Zurich, National University of Singapore, University of Illinois, and UCLA. The centers consist of compute nodes enabled with Xilinx Alveo compute acceleration hardware. These systems are remotely accessible by researchers around the world. If you're interested for more information and to apply and join the program, you can follow the web link that's on the slides now and where you saw this talk advertised. Okay, so this Tech Talk series will run over the summer and we will introduce a range of different research topics related to the program. The talks are free and open to anyone, so please feel free to share with your colleagues as appropriate. To introduce our first speaker, Dario Coralija is a doctoral student in the system group at ETH Zurich, and he will present his work on Coyote, and he will be asking and perhaps answering the question, do OS abstractions make sense in FPGAs? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Dario. I'm, a, as Katal mentioned, a PhD student in the systems group at ETH Zurich. So I'll be presenting Coyote, uh, the system we built. Uh, Coyote is a standard execution environment or an FPGA shell for hybrid computing uh, systems, hybrid heterogeneous computing systems. And one of the focal points that we wanted to kind of explore with Coyote is to what extent can traditional operating system abstractions uh, make sense in kind of these novel heterogeneous systems. Now, uh, this talk is largely based on a talk we gave last year at the OSDI, and I will mention kind of the current status of the project and uh, some of the future directions that uh, we might be taking. Now, I'm not going to go into a long introduction. I don't think this crowd needs it, but hybrid computing systems consisting of a general purpose CPU coupled with uh, an FPGA for some sort of acceleration uh, are gaining a lot in popularity, especially in recent years. You have big tech companies like Amazon and Alibaba who are offering kind of their cloud instances which you can rent with these systems, with Xilinx chips. You have Microsoft and Intel who also have the systems of their own. And in general, they're actually quite present in modern uh, data centers and then cloud environments, right? And if you take into the account that uh, Moore's law is pretty much dead at this point, these systems start to make quite a bit of sense, right? And because we believe in this uh, as well, uh, we uh, built kind of one of these systems at ETH. It's called Encian. Uh, Encian is essentially a no compromise research computer. This is how it was envisioned. Uh, and this board is actually in our office. It is up and running and Coyote has been ported to the NCN as well. And if you want to learn more about it, you can check uh, the link there, right? Um, now, these systems are often, often able to provide much more performance at lower power consumption, which is not negligible, uh, compared to maybe more conventional systems with ASICs or more traditional accelerators, right? Uh, however, their main advantage is their flexibility. So if you look into this picture here, there's a bunch of interfaces that we can use. There's a bunch of different stuff that we can utilize. Uh, and as an example, we can run in-network data processing, we can run in-memory data processing, we can do various types of um, prototyping, we can do some offloading for the acceleration and so on, right? However, as there's no free lunch, right? You have uh, the main problem with these systems is their complexity, right? So on one side, we have a CPU. On the other, we have an FPGA, maybe we have some external I.O. on the FPGA side, storage, network, memory, uh, and all of this just compounds to the overall complexity, right? And this picture here actually shows uh, one of the earlier layouts that we have of the Coyote, and as you can see, it can get quite messy quite quickly, right? And although there's been quite a bit of, I would say, positive strides in recent years in terms of the, on the compiler side, in the high-level synthesis, we're still not at a stage where you can just give these systems to somebody who didn't maybe have experience with them and expect them to kind of produce performance designs uh, straight away, right? So, and the main problem is the lack of proper abstractions that we usually find uh, in operating systems on the CPUs, for instance, and that we usually also just take for granted, right? So for this reason, there's been quite a bit of uh, work in this area, more recent work, also work that spans probably uh, up to like last 10 years or so. Uh, and this work kind of tries to apply uh, some of the ideas from the operating system design, so regarding scheduling, allocation, management, and so on, to these kind of FPGA-centric computers. 
And most of this work focuses or targets particular subsets of functionality and tries to optimize these alone, right? However, what makes these OS abstractions so difficult to implement is actually the interaction between all of these functionalities. So if you have, for instance, virtual memory, depends on the physical memory management, the physical memory management might actually depend on the physical network management. Uh, if you have scheduling, you, you need to take into account all the stateful services that exist. Uh, everything depends on the execution environment that you provide and so on, right? And you can see these kind of interdependence with these arrows here. Now, so rather than kind of looking at isolated abstraction, Coyote tries to examine a more kind of general purpose approach. So Coyote provides a complete minimal core set of essential features above which other services can then be based, right? Um, and one parallel that we like to draw is uh, between Coyote on one side and then something like a microkernel in the operating system domain on the other side. Now, I'm going to give quite a high level overview of the Coyote at this point. So Coyote splits the FPGA hardware into static and dynamic regions. Static region is always online. It provides kind of the base functionality, the essential features. And this is quite a common approach. Many systems use this approach. Now, one difference in Coyote is that we also include services in this static region, right? So services like network stacks, memory stacks, and other services that can be added, right? Uh, and these services are split across all the applications that are running inside Coyote. On the other hand, the dynamic region is kind of the basis for the sharing of the FPGA application. Um, it is split into multiple smaller virtual FPGA regions. Uh, and then one feature of the Coyote is that each of these VFPGAs is further split into the trusted dynamic wrapper, which holds the complete virtual context of the VFPGA and then the fully untrusted uh, user logic, which can be loaded with arbitrary applications that you can write in uh, some of the hardware description languages, and uh, you can also use high-level synthesis so the interfaces conform to HLS as well. And then most of the functionality, which is not in the critical path, we just move it to software. So on the lowest layer of the stack there, we have the kernel driver, which handles most of the management. So memory allocation, uh, register mapping, interrupt servicing, and so on. On top of that, we have the runtime schedule, which schedules the submitted user tasks. And then finally, at the high level, we have the kind of a high level API, which is exposed to the user processes and applications and through which you can kind of interact with the underlying hardware, right? So this high level API, can, you can kind of view it as, as containers in a way. Now, as this is a Xilinx talk, I am going to mention one of the cores that we're using. This is the XDMA IP core. This, we use this one to kind of, for the interaction between the host and the FPGA. There are newer cores, there's QDMA but we found this core to be quite reliable and it kind of has all the functionality that we need. So we kind of stuck with it for the time being, right? Uh, in the Ancient, uh, this is actually replaced with our own ECI core, which, which kind of implements the underlying ECI protocol, full, which is fully cache coherent as well, right? Now, XDMA core has up to four channels, four concurrent channels, and we actually use all four of those. Uh, so one channel is used for streaming. So uh, VFPGA can, VFPGAs or user logic in the VFPGA can actually access the host memory directly through these, uh, for this channel. Another channel is used for data movement between the host and the FPGA. And then the rest of the channels are kind of utility channels. They're used for partial reconfiguration, for fast TLB mappings, and so on, right? Now, you can have a number of these VFPGAs in the, FP, in the Coyote. Uh, this is a compile time parameter, uh, and there is also credit-based queue system there, which kind of prevents malevolent behavior, and which also uh, importantly provides uh, the necessary isolation between the VFPGs. So I'm going to move now into the abstractions. So pretty much the essential abstractions that we have on the on the CPUs are processes, threads, and tasks. Now uh, these kind of are used to multiply X into virtualized resources. On the FPGAs, unfortunately, we don't necessarily have CPUs or cores, so we don't have these entities on which we can base these abstractions, right? So instead, the FPGAs use spatial partitioning of the FPGA fabric, so spatial physical partitioning of the FPGA fabric, and partial reconfiguration where you can kind of swap the logic during runtime without actually affecting the operation of the rest of the system. Now in Coyote, we combine both of these approaches, uh, and we, use a, we provide a multitasking abstraction for a set of Sorry, uh, independent and, as I mentioned, isolated VFPGAs. And also importantly, these VFPGAs are equivalent. They can be temporally and spatially shared. Right? Now, processes also provide the purpose of providing kind of a standard execution environment. So if you compile an application for one process, it should run in another one as well. Uh, and this is really what teases the life of the users, right? Uh, you don't want to have problems porting stuff. Unfortunately, this is pretty much has been always the case in the FPGAs. So FPGAs until very recently didn't really have standard execution environments. 
you have uh, recently Xilinx came up with the effort called the with Vitis toolchain, right? Uh, and Vitis treats an FPGA as kind of a pure computational device. It treats it as an accelerator. However, FPGAs, as I mentioned, can be used for a bunch of other stuff. They can perform some IO, they can be used for in-network data processing. You can place them as a bump in the wire. And this is actually where they shine the most, I think. And so this is not really handled at this point inside a tool chain like this. So in Coyote, because of this, we provide a single user logic interface, the ULI, and this defines a clear set of interfaces for the interaction with every part of the system, uh, including all the services that are there. And the interaction is uh, fairly low level. So for, for queues and uh, we use basically XI protocol, which is well known. We focus on the XI stream because it's fairly easy to use, fairly straightforward to get a hang of. Uh, and the advantages that we gain with this is that first we gain the portability. And then secondly, we also gain the extensibility because uh, we can kind of add additional services following the same kind of pattern uh, quite easily, right? And to show this off, we kind of implement uh, or integrate uh, open source RDMA and TCP IP network stacks. Scheduling, scheduling on the CPUs can be non-preemptive or preemptive. Now, in order to be able to do a preemptive scheduling, you need to interrupt the running process. You need to capture the state of this process. You need to do a context switch. And all of this needs to be done without the process actually doing anything on its own, right? And on the FPGAs, this is almost impossible to achieve. Uh, so capturing the state of an FPGA application is very difficult. There is research in this area, but the overheads are really uh, huge and essentially the performance is, is, is very slow uh, because you would essentially need to capture the state of every register, every memory element in the FPGA and the FPGA is sort of a bunch of memory elements, right? So this would be very difficult to do. You would also need to capture the state of the services as well. Because of this, Cloudy goes for the non-preemptive task-based approach. So uh, the tasks, which are submitted, they run until their completion. And then if a task maybe times out, it, it, it can be kicked out. Uh, for scheduling, we also employ a pretty simple kind of scheduling uh, algorithm. So once the tasks are submitted and they pass through the initial kind of load balancing stage, they go into these priority queues where the, ta the, where the tasks are kind of um, stacked one after the other if they're targeting the same hardware image. So if two tasks are kind of maybe want to do encryption, the same type of encryption, they will be stacked one after the other, and thus we will kind of remove the unnecessary partial reconfiguration in between, right? Now, uh, this is a simple algorithm, but it works well for the, for the intended use case. There are some recent papers, something that I would like to mention that kind of uh, implement, uh, implement preemption or form of preemption in the FPGAs. Uh, and these uh, systems expose explicit preemption interfaces requiring the cooperation for the application. So they would let the application know that they're about to be swapped around. And then the application would actually be responsible for, for kind of saving its own state, right? Now, why we don't go for the preemption is that traditionally operating systems can't trust these user applications, right? So until there is a kind of a, a clear way to do this, uh, to, to fully capture, properly capture state, uh, I think this, uh, this is kind of the choice that, that we go with, right? Now, virtual memory is another important abstraction. Uh, it solves several critical problems. So it gives us kind of this illusion of more memory than is physically there. Uh, it removes the need for fixed memory address compilation. It, it also offers, importantly, the protection, right? Now, unfortunately, in the FPGAs, it just tends to be ignored. Most of the kind of systems just use physical addresses. And this uh, can really lower the programmability of, of such a system, right? So with Coyote, we uh, implement virtual memory. And we opt for a flexible approach, which kind of gives us multiple ways to access both the host memory and the FPGA side memory, right? And uh, we don't use standard MMUs or IOMMU on the CPU side. We actually implement separate software-loaded TLBs in the wrappers of each VFPGA. And this kind of nicely decouples the VFPGA from all the services, from the host memory, from the FPGA memory, it gives us a way to play around with memory allocation. It gives us a way to kind of uh, play around with memory accesses. And it gives us a way to build additional memory models on top of this. And one memory model that we kind of choose to go for, uh, which we find interesting, is the unified memory model, which is used quite often in the, in the GPUs, right? And the idea here is that you can access from the VF from the user logic in the VFPGA. You can access host memory directly, and you can also access data in the local FPGA memory, which, if if not there, is actually demand page from the host side. And importantly, this is hidden from the user, so this is done in the background. So it kind of removes the need from the user, the explicit need for memory management from the users, and kind of simplifies things quite a bit. Right now, it does add some overhead, but this is the price that that you have to pay for the abstractions. Right. 
TLBs, I'm just, they're pretty straightforward TLBs. I'm not going to spend much time on them. One thing that I would like to mention is that uh, we do have like a multiple, I mean, we do support multiple page sizes. So we support fully huge pages. And this actually gives us a much wider coverage than if we were just using uh, regular 4K page sizes, right? And we do this by having basically parallel lookup in, in parallel TLBs with different page sizes. Now, services, I mentioned this is an important aspect of the Coyote. So the first services that we integrate are 100G uh, open source TCP IP and, IP and RDMA network stacks from our group. You can check the paper there as well, which is linked for, for more details on, on, on those as well. And uh, these are basically, these abstract away the complexity of the, and, and yeah, one thing is that in the Coyote, we are kind of focused uh, right now on the RDMA side of things mostly. Um, and these kind of abstract away the complexity of the physical network connections and replace them with much more simple connection oriented ones um, through those uh, AXI streams and, and, and stuff like that. So uh, these are also shared between all the applications uh, and uh, the access is interleaved so that there is also fair sharing. In a similar fashion, we also implement the memory stack abstraction. So um, we, through, by using striping and uh, this has the, this kind of hides the complexity of multiple memory channels. Uh, whilst actually pre preserving that simple one channel interface to the user logic and optimizing the bandwidth across all available channels. And I'll show actually this on the next slide in the architecture in a bit more details, right? And then along these lines, you can kind of have uh, external uh, external storage. You can probably add NVMe drives, play around with those. Uh, you can maybe attach some GPUs, some other accelerators. Maybe you can also go uh, between one service to the other service, maybe just go directly from the network to the GPU without going to the root node. And, and stuff like that. So there's definitely plenty of kind of additional research that could be done on this level. Now, so I'm going back to going back to that memory stack abstraction, right? So the idea with striping is that uh, when we allocate the memory, we actually allocate it across all available channels, going from the most significant bits to the lowest significant bits. And then when the access is made, we actually access all channels in parallel, right? And this kind of has the potential to optimize the bandwidth across all channels and also to optimize the bandwidth across all the FPGAs that are using this kind of memory, right? Uh, now, one thing why I kind of wanted to, to spend some time here is that although this works well, this is great, but uh, the problem is that if you actually want to fit this in the FPGA, you're going to have a lot of issues. And the problem is that if you, for instance, have four memory channels, as many new um, FPGA boards do, uh, you will need four separate DDR controllers, which need to be instantiated in the FPGA fabric. Uh, this is going to create, you, you will need all this crossbar, all this uh, crossbars, all this uh, interconnects, right? This is going to make routing very difficult. It is going to add a lot of congestion. Timing is going to be very difficult to meet and so on. So one kind of conclusion that we reached from all of this is that what would be a good way for the FPGAs moving forward, maybe in the longer term, is to kind of pull this stuff outside of the FPGA. There's really no need for kind of DDR controllers to be uh, in the in the FPGA fabric. There's no need for the interconnect to be, maybe interconnect can be also pulled out. Uh, you can kind of configure it outside. Same thing can apply for the network stack. So especially the lower, the lower, the lower layers of the network stacks, right? Maybe you can leave the higher layers uh, inside uh, the reconfigurable fabric still. And then leave the actual FPGA fabric for the stuff that is dynamic, that is getting changed all the time. This would kind of alleviate the pressure quite a bit, I think. So initially, uh, we kind of developed Coyote on the VCU 118. This is a development board. Uh, we got to know this board quite well. Uh, we spent a lot of time on it. Uh, we have kind of a love and hate relationship at this point. And uh, then once we actually got the, the great opportunity to kind of work with the cluster, we moved to the U250s and the U280s. Myself, I'm pretty much always using U250 because of that extra SLR, but the U280 also has that interesting HBM, which also might be worth looking into how, how to integrate it into the system efficiently. And then I'll mention again the, that Coyote has been ported to the NCN. It is running on those boards as well. Now, uh, the table below, this is a bit of an older table, uh, and it shows kind of the resource overheads, the usage uh, of just the shell itself. Uh, the resource usage has gone up a bit, but it's still even in like more pessimistic approaches if you kind of enable a bunch of stuff. So it, of course, depends on the number of regions, services, how deep are your queues, and so on. Uh, but it, it doesn't go over like 25% of the of the FPGA resources in kind of rough terms, right? Um, which, yeah, the FPGAs have gotten quite big and we find this actually quite acceptable, especially if you take into account how much we're actually willing to give to the operating systems, for instance, right? So um, I'm now going to just uh, kind of a quick evaluation, right? So for a more extended evaluation, please uh, check out the paper. 
Um, so uh, one of the kind of earlier applications, one of the earliest applications that we ported to Coyote, uh, and this was an end-to-end -end application, um, was gradient boosting decision trees. And we were kind of focused on the inference. So this is a supervised machine learning algorithm used for classification and regression. Uh, and this is actually a real world use case. So you can check out the paper again uh, there below, which kind of explains it, the application itself in more details. This was actually used by one of the airline companies to score uh, routes. Uh, and the idea here was to kind of evaluate how this would behave uh, in Coyote in comparison to some, whether the Coyote would be a viable alternative to some of the commercial platforms out there that we had access to at the time, right? So like Amazon F1, Intel Harp and so on. Now, uh, this is the, the application is executed by first loading the, the model into the FPGA uh, on-chip memory, then the data is streamed from the host, we perform the inference and then the results are written back, right? And uh, and uh, this is all done simultaneously to be able to kind of overlap the computation with memory accesses. Now, and then here in this graph, we kind of have the performance, the throughput comparison be be between the systems. And uh, one thing is that Amazon F1 uh, was lagging behind quite significantly due to its kind of strict compute model where you needed to offload data first. So it was quite difficult to efficiently overlap the computed memory accesses. The other platforms performed uh, very similarly. So the harp was running at a bit of a lower frequency. The opposite was true uh, on the NC and it was running at a bit of a higher frequency, but otherwise these, these other platforms actually had a pretty comparative kind of performance, right? And one thing that we can see from this is that, uh, so Coyote can achieve comparable or even better kind of performance than some of the commercial systems out there whilst providing the abstractions that these other systems are missing. And of course this was done for a real world application. Now I'm going to move into what we're kind of doing now a bit more. So this is kind of our current research that we're uh, trying to do. We find that the RDMA is kind of an interesting match with the Coyote because of all that, the, all of that virtualization layer, because you can kind of easily keep track of all the queue pairs and connection uh, details. Uh, one thing that we can do in the Coyote is uh, we can access both the host memory directly from the RDMA, but we can also go directly to the FPGA memory. And this actually opens up kind of room for uh, disaggregated memory research because we can essentially get rid of the PCIe latency. We can cut the PCIe out from the equation completely, right? Uh, we can maybe even get rid of the CPU, replace it with a lower power ARM core or even a soft core CPU just for the control. Uh, and then uh, here in these graphs, I'm also kind of showing the, this is just a pure micro benchmark of the RDMA stack. Uh, which is kind of, uh, this is a Mellanox 100G NIC that we're using. And you can see that the performance is actually quite comparable, uh, which is actually quite nice to see, right? Uh, and then I'm going to kind of show you one use case that we're uh, using this smart disaggregated memory for. So the idea that we're doing right now is we're trying to uh, essentially implement a remote buffer cache. So this disaggregated pool of memory might be kind of, you, you could obtain uh, one of those VFPGA regions from a, from a remote node where the database instance is running. And then you can also offload some of the common database operators like projection, selection, group by, and so on, right? You can also start offloading some of the more kind of system operators for encryption and compression in order to maybe kind of have the data in encrypted format stored in the remote node, thus kind of providing some security and so on. And uh, an interesting thing about these operators is that all of them can be really nicely pipelined uh, and uh, they're actually very, they fit really well into the kind of FPGA domain uh, and they can uh, thus kind of have a really small impact on the overall performance, right? So as an example of this, uh, on the left, you can see basically kind of application in this case that would be loaded in one of those VFPGA regions. So this is a query pipeline, which you can, it's, it's quite dynamic. So you can execute different queries uh, in the remote node. Uh, and you can see on the right, one of the queries, the group by that we are executing. We are, you can see that we're kind of order of magnitude faster than than uh, than kind of implementation just running with a little bit of local buffer cache or implementations running uh, with a remote buffer cache, but executed with just a regular uh, CPU, right? So the FPGA is a really good match for this. And this kind of a smart NIC approach uh, seems to work well. And then to kind of show you where this performance mostly stems from, you can check the graph underneath there, which is the encryption. And in this example, we're reading uh, data from a remote node. Uh, in one case, we're not doing, we're just reading blank data, raw data. Uh, and then in the other case, we're actually performing encryption before transferring the data. And because encryption, it can be really nicely pipelined. This is a highly parallelized uh, version of the AES. Uh, and you can actually see that uh, the, the, the overhead, the performance overhead is pretty much negligible in this case. 
And now I'm just going to mention some of the future plans that uh, that we kind of have. So um, RDMA, this is definitely something that we're doing right now and we'll probably be doing it in the near future as well. I think there's a lot of uh, further uh, options that we can kind of explore. Uh, the NCL I mentioned previously that it has a fully cache coherent link. So this cache coherency might be interesting in terms of kind of exploring additional memory models. Uh, it might even help a unified memory model quite a bit and so on. Virtualization, now this is quite an overloaded term. Virtualization is used uh, throughout this presentation, right? But when I say virtualization here, uh, I mean actually creating a proper hypervisor layer so that we can actually pull those VFPGAs all the way up to the VM layer and then have maybe multiple different VMs uh, which are uh, essentially uh, kind of maybe obtaining one of those VFPGAs and then maybe during the boot up process, loading some of the hardware image uh, to them via partial reconfiguration. HBM as well. So uh, how do we virtualize the HBM? Uh, how do we maybe uh, get rid of the complexity of the HBM? It has a bunch of interfaces. It is not the easiest to interface with. Uh, so this is another option, maybe something similar to striping for this. Uh, and then finally, one, one area which I'm interested in is kind of the compilers. Uh, how can maybe this kind of standard execution environments help uh, the effort with the compilers, right? Yeah, so I will just end it here. So thank you for the invite. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to work with the Xilinx cluster. Uh, I think we've learned quite a lot in our group. Uh, and uh, if you're kind of interested in more details, I know this was maybe a bit uh, too high level, you can check out the paper and then you can also contact us if you kind of need any, any more information, right? So yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Dario. So we have a couple of minutes, maybe we'll try and squeeze in the questions that have been posted. Um, so the first one, does Coyote automatically generate a floor plan given a number of tiles or is the floor plan manually generated? If it is manual in your experience, could you describe how much effort you think typically is needed to put into the floor planning of the design? Yeah, that's that's a great question. It's manual. We we try to provide scripts which kind of generate automatic uh, floor plans, and then we said like, okay, for one, for two regions, and so on. But this just doesn't work, uh, especially when you kind of have all of this stuff uh, which can kind of change in configuration, the services that can change, and so on. So the floor planning is definitely manual. Uh, how difficult it is? Uh, well, it depends maybe how much experience you had with it. I mean, essentially, what you have to do is you have to draw that box. Now, how do you draw that box is a bit uh, is a bit of another question. So, um, yeah, I, I would say that uh, it's you have to kind of be careful about it. But this is something that should be done only once. So once you kind of set up the system for the deployment, and then uh, for the rest of the times, you should be kind of exchanging the dynamic regions, and it should kind of stay fixed. Okay, thanks. Um, there's a couple of more questions. We won't get to all of them, but uh, for everybody on the webinar, if you stay tuned, I'm going to give a hint on how we can continue the discussions at the end. Um, but maybe we'll try and fit in one more question. It's multi-part, so maybe we'll take the first part. Um, could you discuss what the programming um, or what the VFPGA user programming uh, looks like? Is it C, C++ or higher level? Mm -hmm. uh, the question goes on to talk about in particular how the services or service ports are used and the model of computation from the VFPGA. Yeah, so well, most of the programming is done. Uh, you just write your code. Uh, I mean, most of the code has been written so far in the HDL or uh, we probably use system variable the most, right? And then you actually have these stream interfaces, which is quite easy to, to interact with, right? So they have a simple hand handshaking logic. Now, these interfaces are also fully supported by the HLS. So you can also, you can just use an HLS wrapper and then you can write your code in the HLS as well, right? So and this is pretty much a C, right? So uh, you can also do this as well. So these are kind of two options that we have right now. Okay. Well, look, thanks, Dario. We'll move over to Johannes just to briefly introduce. So Johannes de Feinlicht is also a doctoral student at ETH Zurich, this time in the Scalable Parallel Computing Laboratory. And he will be introducing DACE, the data-centric FPGA programming framework with multi-level design. Great. Thanks, Gail. Thanks for organizing this. So obviously, this is work done by a lot of people, not just me. So. They're all listed here. It's involving a lot of current and previous students, PhD students, postdocs, and so on. But I'll I'll give you a FPGA centric view of the work we've been doing with the with the DACE programming model. So as a quick teaser, we've done a lot of work with DACE, but on the FPGA side, so sort of one of our most prominent HPC results is we did a four teraflop stencil from this and a one teraflop single device. Uh, stencil code essentially purely from Python. 
So I'll walk you through um, some of the important concepts of, of what the uh, what the sort of approach of this is and some of the mechanisms and why this might be interesting for you to hopefully uh, get, get you interested in maybe trying this out for yourself. So we are HPC people, just as a warning. So we're going to jump into sort of a slightly higher level of abstraction, what Dario was talking about. Um, but we have the performance to back it up, we think. So um, imagine now that you're writing some, um, some program for HPC. Here on the left, I put a little cute matrix multiplier, the sort of the most naive matrix multiplier you could write uh, in HLS code. And now you want to optimize this. Um, so what does that look like? Well, after a few days, weeks, months of optimizing this, applying all the fancy transformation optimization that you know about, you get something like this on the right. And I would know because I wrote this code on the right. And um, the sort of the message here is that optimized code is a mess. And this is not an FPGA specific problem by any means. FPGA might be even slightly worse, but optimizing a CPU or GPU program or distributed program is very intrusive to your code. So you end up with something that is, is very far from the input you had to begin with. So DACE has as one of its sort of central concepts what we call separation of concerns. So what we recognize is in, in a process like this by an HPC developer, you can distinguish two different roles. You can distinguish the domain scientist who knows about the input application, who knows the problem we're trying to solve, who, so to speak, knows the, um, the what we're trying to solve, uh, from the performance engineer, who is the person who knows how we should solve it. How should we, how should we um, express our program in a way that gets the performance that, that we need in order to satisfy our, our, our whatever throughput latency requirements. Now, these can be two separate people, but not necessarily. So the idea is not that we have to always have a separate person working on the input and another person optimizing it. But the important thing is that the roles are different. So there are two different jobs you're carrying out, and it will be nice if they do not interfere with each other, like we just saw in this, this matrix multiply code. Um, so to give you a brief overview of what DACE is, because DACE is a lot of things, and, and I'll sort of dive into a few of the concepts, but DACE caters to these, these two roles. So um, this is based on, on our SC19 paper. There's a bunch of stuff, that, stuff that's come out since then. So the, the domain scientist, he will work in some high level language. So um, people who do real science, not like us, people in lab coats, uh, they, they don't want to bother with all the nitty gritty details. And to be honest, neither do we. So they write their programs in some sort of high level input language. So this is typically Python based these days, um, but um, we also have DSLs like I mean, NumPy, if you want to call that a DSL, PyTorch. Um, and then on the performance engineer side, DACE has the uh, STFG. So this is a data centric intermediate representation, which is graph based. STFG stands for stateful data flow multigraph, but essentially it's a graph based representation that expresses the, the data flow of the program um, in a way where we can manipulate it. And now the workflow is that the domain scientist takes one of these input languages and passes it through one of the many scientific front ends of, of the state framework and essentially gets out this graph here uh, in the middle. And then the performance engineer can attack this using graph transformations. So now we want to do all these optimizations. Uh, we want to get it from, from just describing the functional, uh, the, the functional semantics of the program to also um, be fast by, by doing all the stuff we know, like tiling and streaming and so on, but doing it on this graph level, right? So we don't change the input code, but we just manipulate this graph. And then finally, this is also um, a code generator. So these STFGs, these graphs are then compiled based on whatever you're targeting, um, uh, whatever hardware architecture, whatever compiler you want to use. We generate either CPU binaries, GPU binaries, or FPGA bit streams, or any combination of the three, which is then run through the DACE runtime. So still all through this high-level Python front end. And then um, we'll get some, some uh, performance results back, which you, you can then use to continue to iterate over your program, still not touching the input. So that, that's sort of a general overview of what day says. And um, I'll just quickly uh, run you through sort of very high level view of why these graphs are useful and what, what they consist of to sort of give you an idea of the mentality that we're working with here. So at the core of your, of your application, of your program, of your scientific kernel, whatever you're running, you will have some, some core computation. So some actual math you're applying to something. 
in this case, we're computing some y based on some uh, input value x. And the, uh, the approach of this is that this is uh, a black box. So at the lowest possible level of computation, we have some sort of black box that does a computation on the smallest possible granularity uh, of data. And now um, what, uh, what data centric now um, uh, means for us is that anything that we access here, so in this case, this value X needs to be explicitly passed into this black box. So this box really sort of blocks the code from being able to access anything that we don't explicitly pass to it. So if we want to read X and do something with X, we need to pass X to the program. So this, this circle oval shape here is an, is an access node into some data container. And then the edge represents data flow from that container into the computation that we're trying to do. And symmetrically on the other side, if we want to write something that it needs to go and edge out. And this is very central because what this means is that we have full control or a few full view of the data flow of the program. We know every piece of data that moves in to a computation out of the computation, which means we have control over it. And as I'm sure you've hear, you've heard a uh, million times before, high performance computing and really any sort of uh, performance or the thing is all about data movement, right? So you want to optimize a program, you want to optimize data movement, and this is this is how we enable that. So we call these little boxes task lets, lets because they're supposed to be at the finest possible granularity. And these data flow edges called mem lets again, because they transport the smallest possible granularity of data. So we probably don't want to compute just a single element. So we also need some parallelism here. So if you now imagine that these data containers are not just individual registers or something, but they're actually some array here, A and B, and we're accessing an element here, index one and uh, into A and index one into B. Then typically, if we're doing HPC, we're accessing a lot of, of memory locations. So for example, over here, we're accessing location zero, one, and then through n minus one. Then it's quite clear that, that this representation would completely explode if you, um, if you needed to draw out every single one of these indices. So in order to do parallelism, we have a concept for um, parametric parallelism, essentially. So on the right-hand side, you have something that represents exactly the left-hand side, but these burgers here top from the top and the bottom they essentially encapsulate a scope uh which which is is parallel so the way you can imagine this is that everything within the scope gets blown up to the left hand side conceptually but all you see is this parametric uh, parallelized construct here on the right so using these few concepts we can then construct um pretty much arbitrary data flow. These containers can be both arrays, but also streams, which is how we can target files and FPJ. But pure data flow is not enough. So if we want to be able to represent arbitrary program, we also need some, some control flow. So this case, for example, if we had um, some data flowing from array A to array B, some data flowing from array C to array A, then it's now important in which order these are executed. And if they were executed in parallel, you might have race conditions because you're reading from A and writing to A. So um, in the representation, we also have states. So a state represents sort of a pure data flow section, and then you can have control flow between these pure data flow sections. And these can then be arbitrarily nested. So inside of my data flow, I can put another control flow graph, where I can put another data flow graph and so on. So you can express any program this way. All right. So that was sort of the rough, uh, rough overview of, of the representation. And then just uh, let's talk about now why this is actually useful. So uh, it's been a while now. Uh, Days has been uh, has been out for a while. We've done a bunch of things. So uh, we've we've shown how we can um, outcompete every other uh, NumPy compiler on on CPU applications. We showed a full scale summit run on a on a 20, uh, 27,000 GPU supercomputer that won the Golden Bell Award in two thousand nineteen. So we've done a lot of work on, on these these. Um, fixed architectures, but uh, for this talk, I want to talk a bit more about the FPGA side of things. So why is this useful for the FPGA context? So looking at this now from the view of the performance engineer, and we look at this, this graph here on the right, this is an example application. Then, then one of the things you'll notice here is that we have these pure data flow sections, which 
from an FPGA on a spatial computing point of view is really what we like to see, right? Because data flow means that we can stream things. It means we can have uh, pipelining. It means that we can uh, we can really exploit the spatial architecture of, of the FPGA. So even though this is not an FPGA specific language per se, it is actually a really nice match for the kind of programming you want to target spatial architectures. And like I mentioned, all data movement is explicit. So, so every time data moves from one piece of computation or one memory to another, it's represented in the graph using these data flow edges, which again is a, an extremely good match for the FPGA paradigm, because as you know, on an FPGA, you cannot just go to the memory controller and say, say give me memory. You always need to have explicit data paths that go through your code and you really want to limit the amount of DRAM accesses and so on. Then we can code generate this stuff. So once you have these graphs, you also just get out the code. And the reason why that is useful is, well, first of all, writing HLS code is maybe not anyone's favorite activity, um, but also because we have the full control over the, the representation, we can make sure that we, we really emit the most compiler digestible code that, 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 um, that we can sort of get out from the representation. So really make sure that this is something that the compiler can, uh, can do with what we expected to do with it, pipeline everything we wanted to pipeline, unroll stuff and so on. So we have a very fine control of, of what comes out of it because we, have, um, because we are also code generating from, from this representation. And then maybe, maybe most importantly, we have the actual optimization phase. So I mentioned this, uh, this thing with graph transformations, and I'll give you a few examples of what kind of optimizations we can now do once we have our application represented in this sort of, uh, this sort of IR. So one example is just a simple offloading. So let's imagine you get in a program that is not written for an FPJ. So this is just a little Python program that uses a couple of BLAS operators. There's an XP, there's a vector addition, and a dot product, um, which has the data flow shown here on your left. So if you want to now offload that's the FPGA, then in days, this is literally just a single line of code. Click off a button, we'll give you the graph here on the right. So this particular transformation will go and look at all the input memories that are used in the section you're transforming and all the output memories, create these control flow states, make sure that um, all the data that is needed by the computation are copied to the FPGA before the computation starts then the actual memories that are in the computation will be replaced with FPGA memories rather than CPU memories. And then finally, um, the, the data that is needed afterwards in the computation is copied back again, right? So I did not, I do not even have to tell that what data should be copied. This is literally just because we have, we can see all the data movement happen in the program. We know what data comes in, we know what data needs to come out and we can just transform it. So the right things are copied to the FPGA and back again. So now, Boom, you have an FPGA program from your CPU program with a single line of code, including all the memory copies, launching the kernel so that the generated code will contain all this, um, all this boilerplate stuff. Another example of transformation is streaming memory accessy. So um, if any of you have written HLS codes, then you'll also know that typically, especially on silings, it's quite beneficial to, to read, a, read memory ahead. So have dedicated processing elements that read from memory and then stream that to your compute element rather than having the memory access directly in your compute. And this is also just a transformation. So uh, we can take your specific accesses, so for example, these reads from the X and Y and the write to the result and just hoist them out to become their own elements that run as parallel processing elements on the FPGA and stream the data directly to the compute. And again, because we have full control of the data movement, we know when this is possible because we can detect the data access patterns and we know exactly what needs to be produced to the stream and consumed from the stream uh, in, the, in the resulting graph. And um, then you also avoid writing all these little processing elements that are just little, um, little modules that do nothing else but read some memory and dump it into a stream. And then I think maybe the coolest one of these examples is streaming between operators. So again, for anyone who's done FPGA optimization, um, you know that one of the most important tools in our toolbox is streaming between different operators, because that's how we get that sweet, sweet pipeline parallelism between multiple modules. And again, in days, because we have full control over the data movement and we know exactly the access pattern of, of everything that's happening, we can actually detect that, for example, here, this, um, this intermediate array here, this FPJZ, uh, is written from one kernel, read from another. And we can look at the access pattern, see that the access pattern is the same, and then the transformation just replace that with a stream that is uh, that is uh, produced by the XP operator and consumed by the Docker operator, and then boom, you have pipeline parallelism between these two operators. So, 
you apply a bunch of tra graph transformations, you optimize your thing, and then you you now ready to compile your, your program. So I showed you before, we, we code generate this. Um, we have this this example here is an example of the Vivado, Vivado HLS code that gets uh, spread out from this. Um, but another great benefit of having this in this IR is that we can also spit out Intel code. So if you want to try out your code on an Intel platform, it's just setting a flag to now we're compiling for Intel instead, and then you get out the corresponding OpenCL code. And also, if you have, we ever tried this, this is not completely trivial because OpenCL sucks. So you definitely want to, uh, it's definitely nice to automate some of all this uh, work of getting your C++ code to compile in this, this OpenCL environment. So things like inserting the right pragmas in the right places, the abstraction for how FIFOs are, which are quite different at Intel, they're global objects, whereas on Silings, they're, they're local um, object passed around. All of this is taken care of. Um, by the code generator. So code generator is great. And that's sort of one of the biggest takeaways I've had in working on this project is, is really nice to not write the code like this manually, that you have a powerful code generator at the, uh, at the end of your, your representation that does all this crap for you. All right. And then because we have a code generator, you also get rid of all this boilerplate. If you've ever written an, an OpenCL application, you will know that you need 300 lines of code in order to run um, a, a vector ad, right? So all this crap that you need to do normally in OpenCL is gone. Uh, all the host device interaction, copying memory back and forth, all of that stuff is gone. It's handled by the code generator. And all you're left with is essentially um, a little Python code. So this is just one example, but um, uh, your Python code will essentially only be, well, apart from actually defining the, the the application, which you can do from any of the number of front ends, it will just be like you were running any other sort of NumPy application. You will create some arrays and you will pass it to the kernel. So uh, you will use your front end to create this graph, um, which will basically just give you back uh, a handle to, to the graph. And that graph you can use like any other Python function. So you call it with some arguments, some NumPy arguments, and it will go and it will compile and run it. Um, so in principle, this works with JIT, but obviously if you're doing FPJ, you don't want to JIT anything because you would be waiting eight hours for the thing to compile, but that the ahead of time compilation is also supported. So you can either compile it explicitly beforehand, or you can run your application once, compile it, cache it, and then uh, run it again later. And in order, in order to interface with the host, you just use NumPy arrays, right? So everything is just sort of a NumPy program. Um, and only once you hit the days, um, hit the actual days program, all the magic underneath happens with, with your inputs and outputs. Uh, and when you actually work with this, we even have a Visual Studio code uh, plugin now. So one of our extremely talented students wrote this. So you can write your programs in your favorite Python front end, and then you actually have direct integration in visual code where you get in your graph, you can directly view, click it, see the data flow, understand what's going on in your program, and then use that as a basis for optimization, which is super awesome. Um, but now let's talk about how you actually write those programs. So I mentioned already a few of these uh, front ends. So this is one we've been working on a lot recently is the, the NumPy front end. And it's a little different from just Python because we really put emphasis on making it as fast as possible from all the valuable information we get from NumPy. Uh, so this example here is an example from NumPy Bench. Um, this is a re recently published work and I just stole the the K3MM kernel here. So this is from Polybench. It's just three major applications in a row. And this is literally all you need to, um, to build your DACE application. So you can see there's some additional annotations here. We put some type hints. They are not even strictly necessary, but what they mean is that you can do ahead of time compilation because if you don't know what A, B, C, or D is, you cannot compile this before you hit the program. So if you want to do FPJ stuff, you probably want to compile ahead of time and then you can add these type hints so it knows what's going on. But otherwise, it's essentially just a NumPy program with one decorator added on top of it. And boom, you get out your um, your STFG, your days graph, and then you can do all your fancy optimizations on that. And um, we get this example gives you a program like the one I showed you that we optimized before. And one of our most recent results is that we actually now managed to compile a full Polybench suite of 30 applications for both Silings and Intel from just a NumPy input like this. So really nothing FPJ specific. We're just taking the NumPy code. We can do all the magic and we we uh, we build Silex and Intel kernels. Now, disclaimer, they are not fast necessarily. 
as you probably also know, optimizing EPJ codes is a lot of effort. So I'm not saying that we have 30 fast applications, but we can compile and run them, which is all, it was already a, a world first. Um, and some of them are actually quite fast with a particular mechanism that I also want to introduce to you now. So in the title of this talk, you saw something with multi-level. So if you're familiar with MLIR, the concept is essentially the concept of lowering. So I showed you all these graphs with had to, which have these fairly low level concepts. You have your little computations, you have your arrays and some data moving between them, but sometimes you just want a matrix multiply. You don't want to implement your own matrix multiply and any reasonable scientific code will not roll their own matrix multiply. They will call MKL or Kuplas or whatever. So we have this concept of library nodes, um, which enables multi-level design in days, which essentially means that you can have these high level operators that represent not just a, a tiny uh, computation, but actually encapsulate something corresponding to a library call, but also expose a lot of other mechanisms that are useful for us. For example, if you wrote your program like this, you have an M and then a, a matrix multiplication with a B. This can mean any number of things, right? This can mean a matrix, matrix product, it means a matrix vector product, a vector vector product, which are all different kernels, right? There will all be different blast operators, whatever. It could even be a batch matrix, matrix product, right? If it's a higher level tensor that's multiplied by a matrix. And what we can do now is because we can plug in these high level operators, we can now expand this node to become the correct implementation. So if we detect that these are both vectors, we expand to a matrix, matrix product and so on. And the reason why I say multi-level is because we can we can do this sort of recursively. So we have, um, not recursively, but multiple levels. So once we find out, for example, this image vector product, we can now also choose how do we want to run this. And this is one of the reasons why we can make a lot of these kernels very fast, very easily is because when we can detect from the high level front end from NumPy or whatever we use, that something is a operation that we recognize, we can just go and substitute in our fastest possible implementation of, for example, a major vector product, and then just admit that specific component of, of the graph that does this fast. So you also get this, this powerful toolbox of, of sort of common, common operators. They're also fully extensible, so you can write these yourself uh, in order to make, make all this, this standard stuff fast. So these BLAS examples I showed you, you would essentially have to do almost no work yourself because the BLAS operators exist and the transformations make everything stream and you essentially have the fastest thing that you can get on FPJ. Then just briefly to mention what else we're doing. So we have PyTorch, uh, a few people in our lab working on this right now. This is also already fully working for CPU and GPU, um, but we're also uh, working on the FPJ aspect of this. So getting out um, neural networks based on some uh, some high level front end here, PyTorch, and uh, it uses um, Onyx as well. And what we published earlier this year was stencil flow. So we made a, a DSL. So I also mentioned one of the ways we sort of expect to use days and days to be used is using DSLs that can emit specific graphs in ways that, that uh, solve problems very well. So we made a stencil DSL for FPJ specifically. Um, this was at CGO. Um, where the input is a JSON representation like this. So essentially the only thing you describe is what are your inputs and what is your computation? And then it will emit uh, a sort of fully streaming FPJ architecture that does all of this. Uh, so again, just spits out the, the SUG from this. And, and again, these library nodes become extremely useful because all of this graph is like I mentioned, this is not specific to any, uh, any kind of vendor, this is just, um, this is just a, a RR representation that we can now compile for signing to Intel. So by keeping the stencil operators as some high level concept, it's not super important what's in here, but they essentially conceptually represent a stencil. We can now also expand these to specific implementations that are fast. So like I mentioned, just because you can compile for something doesn't mean it's fast. So for stencil specifically, we need to do different things. So for example, for Intel, we want to use shift registers. So then we can take these stencil nodes specifically turn them into something as fast for Intel or for Xilinx, we need to do manual buffering, which is a mess, but once it's done, it's done, it looks something like this. And then we can compile something that runs runs really fast on Xilinx. So all of the scaffolding, all the all this, the memory axes, all the host interaction is implemented exactly once. And then only the specific parts you want to tweak or optimize for an architecture, you can then you can then do at whatever level you feel like doing it. You can, you can even inline HLS or RTL directly if you want to. And this will emit whatever fancy code you need to make this fast. 
All right, so just returning to resolve the beginning. So with the stencil flow, we did four teraflops on, on multi-node. This was on Stratix 10. And a single node, we also broke uh, one teraflop with this. And just to emphasize, the user would literally just have to run uh, a Python script on some JSON thing. Granted, wait eight hours for the compilation, but that's not our fault. Um, the, the sort of the whole chain of the, the DSL and the domain optimizations and the code generator means we get extremely fast performance out of this. And we're working on sidings. This is still work in progress. There are some important optimization we didn't uh, get to do yet. But uh, like I said, we can really do from the same input, we can do both sidings and Intel from, uh, from the same DSL. Uh, and we have a student at the moment also working in HBM, which will be quite criti critical for, for making this, this really fast. All right, so I know I'm a bit late now, so just to summarize why you should care about all the stuff I've talked about. So uh, this core concept of separating the writing the program, so the, the, what, um, the what from the how, we think is an extremely important concept in order to, to make accessing FPGA program or any sort of HPC, HPC programming, making that more accessible without ruining the source code when you want to optimize it. We have this huge toolbox of, of very powerful transformations that mean that a lot of this, this work you normally have to do to optimize programs is essentially just calling a transformation on your code, um, which is enabled by the fact that we know all the data movement uh, of the program. We can do cross-platform code generation. So if you don't want to lock yourself into a specific vendor, you can, you can basically get that for free by using uh, the intermediate representation instead of writing the HLS or low-level code directly. The, actual input will just be some high level Python and the way you call into your program will be will just be interoperable with any other Python stuff you have going on, uh, which includes a lot of different front ends. So I showed you we have um, PyTorch, we have a stencil front end, we have NumPy and a lot of these, these very powerful ways of writing code productively. Um, and then because we have this multi-level design concept, we can also make sure that all these well-known things that we know how to accelerate, like a matrix multiply or a stencil operator, that they are as fast as they can possibly be without you having to do it manually. All right. So, uh, oh yeah. And like I mentioned briefly, we are also rolling out RTL support. It's already possible, but we're doing a lot of cool things with, with RTL at the moment, which, which should be happening soon. Again, without having to change everything, just plugging in your RTL in the place where it's critical and then letting days take care of the rest. All right, thank you for listening to all my rambling about days. Um, if you think any of this is interesting, then we're very, very interested in working with you. If you have any programs you're interested in accelerating or any questions, then uh, please reach out. Always looking for more cool applications to accelerate. Thank you. That was great, Johannes. Thank you very much for that. The first question is, how does DACE compare to Vitus? Both are based on data flow graphs. So DACE uses Vitus underneath. So eventually, one day, once the SDFG gets code generated, this thing will be compiled with Vitus. Um, now, Vitus is a lot of things. Um, so Vitus has sort of swallowed a lot of the, the Silinx infrastructure. So to be honest, I'm not sure entirely which aspect of Vitus you're referring to. To me, Vitus is primarily a compiler. So, so at the lowest level of of our stack, we will use Vitus to compile and link our kernels and, and package them with the shell to get the get the final bitstream out. Um, so it's not a, definitely not a competition, but rather uh, a tool that we use as part of, of compiling our stuff for signings. Um, and Johannes, the next one, what are the limitations of DACE when it comes to data access patterns? So how can you generate an efficient on-chip memory implementation from loop access patterns? Uh, so. I mean, they're not really any limit limitations, but they're limitations to what is easily optimizable. So the the representation that we use, it, it can represent anything. There are no restrictions of what you can represent, but if there's a lot of control flow involved, it gets really hard to optimize, and then it becomes sort of less useful. Apart from the code generator, sort of the transformations become difficult. Um, but in general, you can, you can have any access pattern. So because it is data flow, um, there, there are no sort of, as long as the, the graph is written correctly, there is no sort of illegal access because this should all be detected in the way we generate it. So you can have conflicts, um, you can access the same, you can read the same things multiple times, any sort of pattern you want. Um, but, but yeah, in terms of actually optimizing it, of course, it needs to be fairly analyzable if you want to do anything really clever with it. So in terms of your question on, on using on-chip memory, 
So a typical way you can do this is if you have a one of these map constructs, which essentially are parallel loops, uh, you can you can tile those. So that's a standard transformation. So you will split that into sort of outer inner tile, and then you could, for example, uh, in the outermost tile, you could copy the in incoming data into a local buffer, and then run the inner loop, which will only operate on the on chip memory copy something back out afterwards and so on. So doing something like moving stuff into on-chip memory is a very typical uh, very typical kind of transformation that you can do with the days using things like map tiling and inserting uh, local buffers into your, your graph. That's great, thanks. And how long does the conversion from Python MLIO or framework to SDFG take to run? And is there any significant overhead in that compilation part? Yeah, so first a clarification, we have nothing to do with MLIR actually, and that was not super clear. Uh, the This multi-level expansion concept that we have is inspired by the MLIR mentality. So the, the, the reason why I mentioned MLIR is because if you are familiar with MLIR, you will be familiar with the concept of lowering, which is what we do, but we have nothing to do with MLIR. So we started our project before MLIR existed. Um, but um, in terms of, of the rest of your question, so the... I mean, conversion, I guess, wouldn't be the right word here, but rather the, the code generation. So there are multiple stages here. You have a front end. The front end will generate an SGFG. The SGFG goes through some basic sort of um, optimization stages just to turn into something reasonable. Then you can do your optimization, and then you can code generate that and compile that. All these stages take some amount of time, depending on how large your program is. The compilation is obviously not us. That's We just call it GCC or Clang or Vitus or whatever. Um, in terms of code generation, this is not so bad. Once the programs become very big, it, it might take a couple of seconds, but code generation is not really an issue. Uh, the transformation passes. So if you want to do a lot of optimizations on really, really large programs, like very large neural networks, this can end up taking a while, mostly because it's Python. So there is definitely a performance hit there by doing certain things in Python. Um, but for the FPGA's development, there's nothing in that flow that takes a long time compared to the actual FPGA compilation, right? So yeah, sure. it's not really something we've been bothered with. Um, but yeah. there's definitely some upper limit to how big stuff can get before it starts getting a bit tedious because we use Python. That is sort of the consequence of, of our stuff being Python based. Yeah, okay, thanks. And a final question. The output HLS appears monolithic. Can DACE generate modular or multi-kernel designs to help with things like SLR crossing or timing closure? on Alveo, example, by partitioning the data flow graph based on some resource estimate of the nodes or edges. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it is not monolithic. I didn't really show examples of this, but in principle, you can have multiple kernels going on in your program. You can mix this in any way you want. So there can be, you can have your program that flows and then somewhere in that program, you can have a section that will be offloaded to the FPJ, which will be a kernel. Somewhere else you can have another section that's offloaded to the FPJ, which can be a kernel. Um, so there can be multiple kernels there, but in terms of how you map this to the device, this is not something we have done a lot of work on yet. So this is a very good question because it's one of the things that are on our to-do list and essentially just waiting for the right student to jump on it, doing something more informed on how we place and route it. So uh, you're right that it would be a very good idea to uh, do some sort of, of um, informed floor planning-esque thing with data flow that we have. Because I mean, honestly, we really should because we have all this nice information of how things are connected and we have this view of the data flow and we could definitely use that in order to do flow planning. So uh, this is a very good idea. We just haven't done that yet, but it's on the to-do list. Uh, you can do it yourself, right? So you can put anything into the data framework. You can put in configuration files and flags and whatever, but it doesn't automatically do this at the moment. Okay, Johannes, that's all the questions we have in the Q&A. With that, I'll conclude the session and a final thank you to the two speakers for the really great talks today.